From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oates, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters and friends everywhere, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at this conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to participants in this conference throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Brian Mathias and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with High on the Mountain Top and will now favor us with Press Forward Saints. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Shane M. Bowen of the Seventy, after which the choir will sing, I Know That My Redeemer Lives.
kind Father in heaven, joyfully we bow our heads before thee on this, the holy Sabbath day. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, to be gathered here and throughout the world to worship thee and to worship thy Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for family. We are grateful that thou art our Father and we recognize thee and recognize that we are brothers and sisters. Father, we pray that we may love each other and that we may serve each other and that we may be kind and loving to each other. We're grateful, Father, to be able to be at this general conference. We recognize that Thou hast called in these the latter days prophets, seers, and revelators to deliver Thy word worldwide. We pray, Heavenly Father, that during this conference we may listen carefully that we will be able to be instructed and to be edified and sanctified, and then take that which we have learned and bind ourselves to act in all holiness before Thee. We thank Thee, O God, for a prophet, even our President Nelson, for his goodness, for his life, and for the direction that he receives for this Church. Now we say these things and invoke Thy Spirit to be with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Amy A. Wright, who serves as second counselor in the primary general presidency. We will then hear from Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Elder Michael T. Ringwood of the Seventy. As Job in the Old Testament, in a time of suffering, some might feel that God has abandoned them. Because we know that God has power to prevent or remove any affliction, we may be tempted to complain if He does not do it, perhaps questioning, if God does not grant the help I pray for, how can I have faith in Him? At one point in his intense trials, righteous Job said, Then know that God has wronged me and drawn His net around me. Though I cry I have been wronged, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. In his response to Job, God demands, Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Or in other words, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me, that you may be justified? Jehovah forcefully reminds Job of his omnipotence and omniscience, and Job, in deepest humility, admits he possesses nothing even close to the knowledge, power, and righteousness of God, and he cannot stand in judgment of the Almighty. I know that thou canst do everything, he said, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." In the end, Job was privileged to see the Lord, and the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. It truly is folly for us with our mortal myopia to presume to judge God, to think, for example, I'm not happy, so God must be doing something wrong. To us, his mortal children in a fallen world who know so little of past, present, and future, he declares, All things are present with me, for I know them all. Jacob wisely cautions, Seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hand. Behold, ye yourselves know that he counseleth in wisdom and in justice and in great mercy over all his works. Some misunderstand the promises of God to mean that obedience to Him <clears throat> yields specific outcomes on a fixed schedule. They might think, if I diligently serve a full-time mission, God will bless me with a happy marriage and children. And, or if I refrain from doing schoolwork on the Sabbath, God will bless me with good grades. Or if I pay tithing, God will bless me with that job I've been wanting. If life doesn't fall out precisely this way or according to an expected timetable, they may feel betrayed by God. But things are not so mechanical in the divine economy. We ought not to think of God's plan as a cosmic vending machine where we select the desired blessing, insert the required sum of good works, and the order is promptly delivered. God will indeed honor His covenants and promises to each of us. We need not worry about that. The atoning power of Jesus Christ, who descended below all things and then ascended on high, and who possesses all power in heaven and in earth, ensures that God can and will fulfill His promises. It is essential that we honor and obey His laws, but not every blessing predicated on obedience to law is shaped, designed, and timed according to our expectations. We do our best, but leave to Him the management of blessings, both temporal and spiritual. President Brigham Young explained that his faith was not built on certain outcomes or blessings, but on his witness of and relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, My faith is not placed upon the Lord's working upon the islands of the sea 
upon his bringing the people here, nor upon the favors he bestows upon this people or upon that people, neither upon whether we are blessed or not blessed, but my faith is placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and my knowledge I have received from him. Our repentance and obedience, our service and sacrifices do matter. We want to be among those described by Ether as always abounding in good works. But it is not so much because of some tally kept in uh, celestial account books. These things matter because they engage us in God's work and are the means by which we collaborate with Him in our own transformation from natural man to saint. What our Heavenly Father offers us is Himself and His Son, a close and enduring relationship with them through the grace and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We are God's children, <clears throat> set apart for immortality and eternal life. Our destiny is to be His heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Our Father is willing to guide each of us along His covenant path with steps designed to our individual need and tailored to His plan for our ultimate happiness with Him. We can anticipate a growing trust and faith in the Father and the Son, an increasing sense of their love, and the consistent comfort and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Even so, this path cannot be easy for any of us. There is too much refining needed for it to be easy. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit the Father taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The process of God-directed purging and purifying will, of necessity, be wrenching and painful at times. Recalling Paul's expression, we are joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. In the midst of this refiner's fire, rather than get angry with God, get close to God. Call upon the Father in the name of the Son. Walk with them in the Spirit day by day. Allow them over time to manifest their fidelity to you. Come truly to know them and truly to know yourself. Let God prevail. The Savior reassures us, listen to Him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before Him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these, my brethren and my sisters, that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. Consider some examples of faithful men and women who trusted God, confident that His promised blessings would be upon them in life or in death. Their faith was based not on what God did or did not do in a particular circumstance or moment in time, but on knowing Him as their benevolent Father and Jesus Christ as their faithful Redeemer. When Abraham was about to be sacrificed by the Egyptian priest of Elkanah, he cried out to God to save him, and God did. Abraham lived to become the father of the faithful, through whose seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. Earlier on this very same altar, that same priest of Elkanah had offered up three virgins who, because of their virtue, would not bow down to worship gods of wood or stone. They died there as martyrs. <clears throat> Joseph of old, sold into slavery as a youth by his own brothers, in his anguish turned to God. Gradually he rose to prominence in his master's house in Egypt, but then had all this progress ripped away because of the false accusations of Potiphar's wife. Joseph could have thought, so prison is what I get for keeping the law of chastity. Instead, he continued to turn to God and was prospered even in prison. Joseph suffered a further crushing disappointment when the prisoner he befriended, despite his promise to help Joseph, forgot all about him 
after being restored to his position in Pharaoh's court. In due course, as you know, the Lord intervened to put Joseph in the highest position of trust and power next to Pharaoh, enabling Joseph to save the house of Israel. Surely Joseph could attest that all things work together for good to them that love God. Abinadi was intent on fulfilling his divine commission. I finish my message, he said, and then it matters not what happens to me, if so be that I am saved. He was not spared a martyr's death, but assuredly he was saved in the kingdom of God, and his one precious convert, Alma, changed the course of Nephite history leading up to the coming of Christ. Alma and Amulek were delivered from prison in Ammonihah in answer to their plea, and their persecutors were slain. Earlier, however, these same persecutors had cast believing women and their children into a raging fire. Alma, witnessing the horrific scene in agony, was constrained by the Spirit not to exercise the power of God to save them from the flames, that they might be received up to God in glory. The Prophet Joseph Smith languished in jail at Liberty, Missouri, powerless to help the Saints as they were pillaged and driven from their homes in the bitter cold of winter. O oh God, where art thou? Joseph cried. How long shall thy hand be stayed? In response, the Lord promised, Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment, and then if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou art not yet as Job. In the end, Joseph could declare with Job, Though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. Elder Brooke P. Hales related the story of Sister Patricia Parkinson, who was born with normal eyesight but by age 11 had gone blind. Elder Hales recounted, I've known Pat for many years and recently told her that I admired the fact that she's always positive and happy. She responded, Well, you've not been at home with me, have you? I have my moments. I've had rather severe bouts of depression, and I've cried a lot. However, she added, from the time I started losing my sight, it was strange, but I knew that Heavenly Father and the Savior were with me, my family and me. Those who ask me if I am angry because I am blind, I respond, who would I be angry with? Heavenly Father is in this with me. I am not alone. He is with me all the time. In the end, it is the blessing of a close and abiding relationship with the Father and the Son that we seek. It makes all the difference and is everlastingly worth the cost. We will testify with Paul that the sufferings of this present mortal time are not worthy to be, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I bear witness that no matter what our mortal experience may entail, we can trust God and find joy in Him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. A few years ago, at a family gathering, my then eight-year-old nephew, William, asked our oldest son, Britton, if he would play ball with him. Britton enthusiastically responded, yes, I would love to. After they had been playing for quite some time, a ball got away from Britton, and he accidentally broke one of his grandparents' antique pots. Britton felt awful. As he began picking up the broken pieces, William walked over to his cousin and lovingly patted him on the back. He then comforted, don't worry, Britton. I broke something at Grandma and Grandpa's house once, and Grandma put her arm around me and said, It's okay, William. You are only five. To which Britton responded, But William, I'm 23. <laughs> we can learn much from the scriptures about how our Savior Jesus Christ will help us successfully navigate the things in our lives that are broken, no matter our age. He can heal broken relationships with God, 
broken relationships with others, and broken parts of ourselves. While the Savior was teaching in the temple, a woman was brought to him by the scribes and Pharisees. We do not know her full story, just that she was taken in adultery. Often the scriptures give only a small portion of someone's life, and based on that portion, we sometimes tend to exalt or condemn. No one's life can be understood by one magnificent moment or one regrettable public disappointment. The purpose of these scriptural accounts is to help us see that Jesus Christ was the answer then, and He is the answer now. He knows our complete story and exactly what we suffer, as well as our capabilities and vulnerabilities. Christ's response to this precious daughter of God was, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Another way to say, Go and sin no more, could be, Go forth and change. The Savior was inviting her to repent, to change her behavior, her associations, the way she felt about herself, her heart. Because of Christ, our decision to go forth and change can also allow us to go forth and heal. For He is the source of healing all that is broken in our lives. As the great mediator and advocate with the Father, Christ sanctifies and restores broken relationships, most importantly, our relationship with God. The Joseph Smith translation makes it clear that the woman did follow the Savior's counsel and changed her life. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on His name. It is unfortunate we do not know her name or other details about her life after this moment, because it would have required great determination, humility, and faith in Jesus Christ for her to repent and change. What we do know is she was a woman who believed on His name with the understanding that she was not beyond the reach of His infinite and eternal sacrifice. In Luke chapter 15, we read a parable of a man who had two sons. The younger son asked his father for his inheritance, took his journey into a far country, and wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The fact that the father ran to his son, I believe, is significant. The personal hurt that the son had inflicted upon his father was surely deep and profound. Likewise, the father may have been genuinely embarrassed by his son's actions. So why didn't the father wait for his son to apologize? Why didn't he hold out for an offering of restitution and reconciliation before extending forgiveness and love? This is something I have often pondered. The Lord teaches us that forgiving others is a universal commandment. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. Extending forgiveness and love can take tremendous courage and humility. It can also take time. It requires us to put our faith and trust in the Lord as we assume accountability for the condition of our hearts. Here lies the significance and power of our agency. With the depiction of this father in the parable of the prodigal son, the Savior emphasized that forgiveness is one of the noblest gifts we can give one another, and most specifically ourselves. 
Unburdening our hearts through forgiveness isn't always easy, but through the enabling power of Jesus Christ, it is possible. In Acts chapter 3, we learn about a man who was born lame and whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. The lame beggar was over 40 years old and had spent his entire life in a seemingly never-ending state of wanting and waiting, for he was dependent on the generosity of others. One day, he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple and asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Oftentimes, we can find ourselves, like the lame beggar at the gate of the temple, patiently or sometimes impatiently, waiting upon the Lord waiting to be healed physically or emotionally, waiting for answers that penetrate the deepest part of our hearts, waiting for a miracle. Waiting upon the Lord can be a sacred place, a place of polishing and refining where we can come to know the Savior in a deeply personal way. Waiting upon the Lord may also be a place where we find ourselves asking, Oh God, where art thou? A place where spiritual perseverance requires us to exercise faith in Christ by intentionally choosing Him again and again and again. I know this place. And I understand this type of waiting. I spent countless hours at a cancer treatment facility united in my suffering with many who were yearning to be healed. Some lived, others did not. I learned in a profound way that deliverance from our trials is different for each of us, and therefore our focus should be less about the way in which we are delivered and more about the Deliverer Himself. Our emphasis should always be on Jesus Christ. Exercising faith in Christ means trusting not only in God's will, but also in His timing, for He knows exactly what we need and precisely when we need it. When we submit to the will of the Lord, we will ultimately receive substantially more than that which we had desired. My dear friends, we all have something in our lives that is broken, that needs to be mended, fixed, or healed. As we turn to the Savior, as we align our hearts and minds with Him, as we repent, He comes to us with healing in His wings, puts His arms lovingly around us, and says, It's okay. You are only five or 16, 23, 48, 64, 91. We can fix this together. I testify that there is nothing in your life that is broken, that is beyond the curative, redeeming, and enabling power of Jesus Christ. In the sacred and holy name of He who is mighty to heal, Jesus Christ, amen. Imagine with me, with me for a moment, standing on a mountain in Galilee, witnessing the wonder and glory of the resurrected Savior visiting His disciples. How awe-inspiring to consider personally hearing these words which He shared with them, His solemn charge to, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
Surely those words would empower, inspire, and move each of us as it did his disciples. Indeed, they devoted the rest of their lives to doing just that. Interestingly, it wasn't only the apostles who took Jesus' words to heart. Members of the early church from the newest to the most seasoned took part in the Savior's great commission, sharing the good news of the gospel with those they met and knew. The determination to share their testimony of Jesus Christ helped his newly established church grow expansively. We too, as Christ's disciples, are invited to heed his commission today, as if we were there on that mountain in Galilee when he first proclaimed it. This commission began again in 1830, when Joseph Smith set apart his brother Samuel as an early missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ. Since that time, more than one and a half million missionaries have traveled throughout the world teaching all nations and baptizing those who embrace the glad tidings of the restored gospel. This is our doctrine, our fond desire. From our young children to the eldest among us, ye yearn for the time when we can heed the Savior's call and share the gospel with the nations of the world. I'm sure you young men and young women felt a similar empowering challenge from our prophet yesterday as he invited you to prepare for for full-time missionary service, just as the Savior did with his apostles. Like sprinters at the starting blocks, we wait with anticipation for the official invitation, complete with the prophet's signature signaling the start of the race. This desire is noble and inspirational, however. Let's consider this question. Why don't we all begin now? You might ask, how can I be a missionary without a name badge? Or we tell ourselves, the full-time missionaries are set apart to do this work. I'd like to help, but perhaps later when life has calmed down a bit. Brothers and sisters, it is much simpler than that. Gratefully, the Savior's Great Commission can be accomplished through simple, easily understandable principles taught to each of us from childhood. Love, share, and invite. The first thing we can do is love as Christ loved. Our hearts are heavy with the human suffering and tensions that we see, that we see throughout the world during these tumultuous times. However, we can also be inspired by the outpouring of compassion and humanitarianism that has been demonstrated by people everywhere through their efforts to reach out to the marginalized, those displaced from their homes, separated from their families, or experiencing other forms of sorrow and despair. Recently, news sources reported how a group of mothers in Poland, out of concern for fleeing desperate families, left fully equipped strollers on a train station platform in a neat line, ready and waiting for refugee mothers and children who would need them at that border crossing as they deboarded a train. Surely our Heavenly Father smiles upon acts of selfless charity such as these, for as we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Whenever we show Christ-like love towards our neighbor, we preach the gospel, even if we do not voice a single word. Love for others is the eloquent expression of the second great commandment to love our neighbor. It shows the refining process of the Holy Spirit working within our souls. By demonstrating Christ's love to others, we may cause those who see our good works to glorify our Father which is in heaven. We do this expecting nothing in return. Of course, we hope that they will accept our love and our message, though how they react is not within our control. What we do and who we are certainly is. Through Christ-like love for others, we preach the glorious, life-transforming properties of Christ's gospel. 
and we participate significantly in the fulfilling of His Great Commission. The second thing we can do is share. During the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic, Brother Wiesan from Thailand felt prompted to share his feelings and impressions of what he was learning in his study of the Book of Mormon on his social media account. In one of his particularly personal posts, he shared a story of two Book of Mormon missionaries, Alma and Amulek. His brother Winai, although set in his religious beliefs, was touched by the post and responded unexpectedly, asking, Can I get that book in Thai? Wiesan wisely arranged for a copy of the Book of Mormon to be delivered by two sister missionaries who began teaching his brother. Wiesan joined in virtual lessons, which he shared his feelings about the Book of Mormon. We and I learned to pray and study with a truth-seeking spirit to accept and embrace the truth. Within months, We and I was baptized. Wiesan later said, We have a responsibility to be an instrument in the hands of God, and we must be always ready for Him to do His work in His way through us. Their family miracle came because we, we saw and simply shared the gospel in a normal and natural way. We share all things with others. We do it often. We share what movies and food we like, funny things we see, places we visit, art we appreciate, quotes we're inspired by. How might we simply add to the list of things we already share what we love about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf explained, quote, If someone asks you about your weekend, don't hesitate to talk about what you experienced at church. Tell about the little children who stood in front of a congregation and sang with eagerness how they're trying to be like Jesus. Talk about the group of youth who spent time helping the elderly in rest homes to compile their personal histories." Close quote. Sharing isn't about selling the gospel. You don't have to write a sermon or correct someone's incorrect perceptions. When it comes to missionary work, God doesn't need you to be His sheriff. He does, however, ask you to be His sharer. By sharing our positive experiences in the gospel with others, we take part in fulfilling the Savior's great commission. The third thing you can do is invite. Sister Myra is a recent convert from Ecuador. Her joy in the gospel skyrocketed immediately following her baptism as she invited friends and loved ones around her through her social media accounts. Many family members and friends who saw her posts responded with questions. Myra connected with them, often inviting them to her home to meet with the missionaries together. Myra's parents, her siblings, her aunt, two cousins, and several of her friends were baptized because she courageously invited them to come and see, come and serve, and come and belong. Through her normal and natural invitations, over 20 people have accepted her invitation to be baptized members of the Church of Jesus Christ. This came about because Myra simply invited others to experience the joy she felt as a member of the Church. There are hundreds of invitations we can extend to others. We can invite others to come and see a sacrament service, a ward activity, an online video that explains the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come and see can be an invitation to read the Book of Mormon or visit a new temple during its open house prior to its dedication. Sometimes the invitation is something we extend inward, an invitation to ourselves giving us awareness and vision of opportunities surrounding us to act upon. In our digital age, members often share messages through social media. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of uplifting things 
you might find worthy, worthy of sharing. This content offers invitations to come and see, come and serve, and come and belong. As we invite others to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we take part in the Savior's call to engage in the work of His commission. My beloved brothers and sisters, we have spoken today of three simple, easy things that anyone can do, things you can do. Perhaps you're already doing them even without fully realizing it. I invite you to consider ways that you can love, share, and invite. As you do so, you will feel a measure of joy knowing that you are heeding the words of our beloved Savior. What I am urging you to do is not a new program. You've heard these principles before. This is not the next big thing the Church is asking you to do. These three things are merely an extension of who we already are as disciples of Jesus Christ. No name badge or letter is required. No formal calling is needed as these three things become a natural part of who we are and how we live, they will become an automatic, unforced expression of genuine love. As those disciples of Christ who gathered together to learn from Him in Galilee 2,000 years ago, we too can embrace the Savior's charge and go into all the world preaching the gospel. As we love, share, and invite, we take part in that great and glorious work that prepares the earth for the return of its Messiah, that we may heed the Savior's call and strive to engage in His great commission is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The first time I noticed this verse, I was not at church or in family home evening. I was watching a sporting event on television. No matter what station I watched and no matter what game it was, at least one person held a sign that read John 3.16. I have come to equally love verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God sent Jesus Christ, His only Son in the flesh, to lay down His life for every one of us. This He did because He loves us and designed a plan for each of us to return home to Him. But this is not a blanket, catch-all, hit-and-miss sort of plan. It is personal, set forth by a loving Heavenly Father who knows our hearts, our names, and what He needs us to do. Why do we believe that? Because we are taught it in the Holy Scriptures. Moses repeatedly heard Heavenly Father speak the words, Moses, my son. Abraham learned he was a child of God, chosen for his mission, even before he was born. By the hand of God, Esther was placed in a position of influence to save her people. And God trusted a young woman, a servant, to testify of a living prophet so Naaman could be healed. I especially love that good man short in stature who climbed a tree to see Jesus. The Savior knew he was there, stopped, looked up into the branches, and spoke these words, Zacchaeus, come down. And we cannot forget the 14-year-old who went into a grove of trees and learned how personal the plan really is. Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him. Brothers and sisters, we are the focus of Heavenly Father's plan and the reason for our Savior's mission. Each of us individually is their work and their glory. To me, no book of Scripture illustrates this more clearly than has my study of the Old Testament. Chapter after chapter, we discover examples of how Heavenly Father and Jehovah are intimately involved in our lives. We have recently been studying about Joseph, the beloved son of Jacob. 
From his youth, Joseph was highly favored of the Lord, yet he experienced great trials at the hands of his brothers. Two weeks ago, many of us were touched by how Joseph forgave his brothers. In Come, Follow Me, we read in many ways, Joseph's life parallels that of Jesus Christ. Even though our sins caused him great suffering, the Savior offers forgiveness, delivering all of us from a fate far worse than famine. Whether we need to receive forgiveness or extend it, at some point we all need to do both. Joseph's example points us to the Savior, the true source of healing and reconciliation. A lesson I love in that account comes from Joseph's brother Judah, who played a part in God's personal plan for Joseph. When Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, Judah convinced them not to take Joseph's life, but to sell him into slavery. Many years later, Judah and his brothers needed to take their youngest brother Benjamin to Egypt. Initially, their father resisted, but Judah made a promise to Jacob he would bring Benjamin home. In Egypt, Judah's promise was put to the test. Young Benjamin was wrongly accused of a crime. Judah, true to his promise, offered to be jailed in Benjamin's place, for he said, How shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Judah was determined to keep his promise and return Benjamin safely. Do you ever feel about others the way Judah felt towards Benjamin? Isn't this how parents feel about their children? How missionaries feel about people they serve? How primary and youth leaders feel about those they teach and love? No matter who you are or your current circumstances, someone feels exactly this way about you. Someone wants to return to Heavenly Father with you. I am grateful for those who never give up on us, who continue to pour out their souls in prayer for us, and who continue to teach and help us qualify to return home to our Father in Heaven. Recently, a, de a dear friend spent 233 days in the hospital with COVID-19. During that time, he was visited by his deceased father who asked that a message be delivered to his grandchildren. Even from beyond the veil, this good grandfather desired to help his grandchildren return to their heavenly home. Increasingly, disciples of Christ are remembering the Benjamins in their lives. Across the world, they have heard the clarion call of God's living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Young men and young women are engaged in the Lord's Youth Battalion. Individuals and families are reaching out in a spirit of ministering, loving, sharing, and inviting friends and neighbors to come unto Christ. Youth and adults are remembering and striving to keep their covenants, filling God's temples, finding names of deceased family members, and receiving ordinances on their behalf. Why does Heavenly Father's personalized plan for us include helping others return to Him? Because this is how we become like Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the account of Judah and Benjamin teaches us about the Savior's sacrifice for us. Through His Atonement, He gave His life to bring us home. Judah's words express the Savior's love. How shall I go up to my Father, and you be not with me? As gatherers of Israel, those can be our words as well. The Old Testament is packed with miracles and tender mercies that are the hallmark of Heavenly Father's plan. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the phrase, It fell on a day, is used three times to emphasize to me that important events happen according to God's timing, and no detail is too small for Him. My new friend Paul testifies of this truth. Paul grew up in a home that was sometimes abusive and always intolerant of religion. While attending school on a military base in Germany, he noticed two sisters who seemed to have a spiritual light. Asking why they were different brought the answer that they belonged to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Soon, Paul began meeting with missionaries and was invited to church. That next Sunday, as he got off the bus, he noticed two men dressed in white shirts and ties. He asked them if they were elders of the Church. They answered yes, so Paul followed them. During the service, a preacher pointed to people in the congregation and invited them to testify. At the end of each testimony, a drummer gave a drum salute and the congregation called out, Amen. 
when the preacher pointed to Paul, he stood up and said, I know Joseph Smith was a prophet and the Book of Mormon is true. There was no drum salute or amens. Paul eventually realized he had gone to the wrong church. Soon, Paul found his way to the right place and was baptized. On the day of Paul's baptism, a member he didn't know told him, You saved my life. A few weeks earlier, this man had decided to look for another church and attended a service with drums and amens. When the man heard Paul bear his testimony of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, he realized that God knew him, recognized his struggles, and had a plan for him. For both Paul and the man, it fell on a day indeed. We too know that Heavenly Father has a personal plan of happiness for each of us because God sent His beloved Son for us. The miracles we need will fall on the very day necessary for His plan to be fulfilled. I testify that this year we can learn more about God's plan for us in the Old Testament. That sacred volume teaches the role of prophets in uncertain times and God's hand in a world that was confused and often contentious. It is also about humble believers who faithfully looked forward to the coming of our Savior, just as we look forward to and prepare for His second coming, His long-prophesied glorious return. Until that day, we may not see with our natural eyes the design of God for all aspects of our lives, but we can remember Nephi's response when faced with something he didn't understand. While he didn't know the meaning of all things, he knew that God loves his children. This is my witness on this beautiful Sabbath morning. May we write it on our hearts and allow it to fill our souls with peace, hope, and eternal joy. God so loved us that He sent His only begotten Son, not to condemn us, but to save us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. On signal from the conductor, we will stand and join the choir in singing How Firm a Foundation. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Hugo E. Martinez of the Seventy. This is the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
Brothers and sisters, at this glorious Easter season, we are so blessed to meet and receive counsel and direction from God's servants. Sacred guidance and teachings from our Heavenly Father help us navigate life in these perilous times. As was prophesied, fires and tempests, wars, rumors of wars, and earthquakes in diverse places, and all manner of abominations, plague, famines, and pestilences are ravaging families, communities, and even nations. There is another scourge sweeping the globe, attacks on your and my religious freedom. This growing sentiment seeks to remove religion and faith in God from the public square, schools, community standards, and civic discourse. Opponents of religious freedom seek to impose restrictions on expressions of heartfelt convictions. They even criticize and ridicule faith traditions. Such an attitude marginalizes people, devaluing personal principles, fairness, respect, spirituality, and peace of conscience. What is religious freedom? It is freedom of worship in all its configurations, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom to act on personal beliefs, and freedom for others to do the same. Religious freedom allows each of us to decide for ourselves what we believe, how we live, act according to our faith, and what God expects of us. Efforts to curtail such religious liberty are not new. Throughout history, people of faith have suffered mightily at the hands of others. Members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are no different. From our beginnings, many seeking God were drawn to this Church because of its teachings of divine doctrine, including faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement repentance, the plan of happiness, and the second coming of our Lord. Opposition, persecution, and violence plagued our first Latter-day Prophet, Joseph Smith, and his followers. Amidst the turmoil in 1842, Joseph published 13 fundamental tenets of the growing Church, including this one. We claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. His statement is inclusive, liberating, and respectful. That is the essence of religious freedom. The Prophet Joseph Smith also stated, quote, I am bold to declare before heaven that I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination, for the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the saints would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics or any other denomination who may be unpopular and too weak to defend themselves. It is love of liberty that inspires my soul civic and religious liberty to the whole of the human race." Close quote. Still, early Church members were attacked and driven thousands of miles from New York to Ohio to Missouri, where the governor issued an order that members of the Church, quote, must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state. Close quote. They fled to Illinois, but the torment continued. A mob murdered the Prophet Joseph, thinking that killing him would destroy the Church and scatter the believers. But the faithful held firm. Joseph's successor, Brigham Young, led thousands in a forced exodus, 1,300 miles west to what is now the state of Utah. My own ancestors were amongst those early pioneer settlers. From those days of intense persecution, 
the Lord's Church has grown steadily to nearly 17 million members, with well over half living outside the United States. In April 2020, our Church celebrated the 200th anniversary of the restoration of the gospel with a proclamation to the world prepared by our First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. It begins, we solemnly proclaim that God loves His children in every nation of the world. Our beloved prophet Russell M. Nelson has further expressed, We believe in freedom, kindness, and fairness for all of God's children. We are all brothers and sisters, each one a child of a loving Father in heaven. His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, invites all to come unto Him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. Consider with me four ways that society and individuals benefit from religious freedom. First, religious freedom honors the first and second great commandments, placing God at the center of our lives. We read in Matthew, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Whether in a chapel, synagogue, mosque, or tin-roofed hut, Christ's disciples and all like-minded believers can express devotion to God by worship of Him and willingness to serve His children. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of such love and service. During His ministry, He cared for the poor, healed the sick and the blind, He fed the hungry, opened His arms to little children, and forgave those who wronged Him, even crucified Him. The scriptures describe that Jesus went about doing good. So must we. Second, religious freedom fosters expressions of belief, hope, and peace. As a Church, we join with other religions, protecting people of all faiths and persuasions and their right to speak their convictions. This does not mean we accept their beliefs, nor they ours, but we have more in common than we have with those who desire to silence us. I recently represented the Church at the annual G20 Interfaith Forum in Italy. I was encouraged, even buoyed up, when I met with government and faith leaders from around the world. I realized wounds and differences can be resolved and even healed when we honor God, the Father of us all, and Jesus Christ, His Son. The great healer of all is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I had an interesting moment as I closed my talk. The previous seven speakers had not closed in any manner of a faith tradition or in the name of God. As I spoke, I thought, do I just say thank you and sit down? Or do I close in the name of Jesus Christ? I remembered who I was, and I knew the Lord would have me say His name to conclude my message, so I did. Looking back, it was my opportunity to express my belief, and I had the freedom of religion to bear my witness of His holy name. Third. Religion inspires people to help others. When religion is given the space and freedom to flourish, believers perform simple and sometimes heroic acts of service. The ancient Jewish phrase, tikkun olam, meaning to repair or heal the world, is being reflected today in the efforts of so many. We have partnered with Catholic charities known as Caritas International, Islamic Relief, and any number of Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, and Christian organizations like the Salvation Army and the National Christian Foundation. Together we serve millions in need, most recently by aiding refugees of war 
with tents, sleeping bags, and food supplies, and providing vaccinations, including polio and COVID. The list of what is being done is long, but so are the needs. No question, people of faith working together can make significant interventions. At the same time, one-on-one -on -one service is often unheralded, but quietly changes lives. I think of the example in Luke when Jesus Christ reached out to the widow of Nain. Jesus, accompanied by a group of followers, came upon the burial procession of the widow's only son. Without him, she was facing emotional, spiritual, and even financial ruin. Jesus, seeing her tear-stained face, said, weep not. Then he touched the bier carrying the body, and the procession halted. Young man, he commanded, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and Jesus delivered him to his mother. Raising the dead is a miracle, but every act of kindness and concern for someone struggling is the covenant way each of us can also go about doing good, knowing God is with us. And fourth, freedom of religion acts as a unifying and rallying force for shaping values and morality. In the New Testament, we read of many turning away from Jesus Christ, murmuring of His doctrine. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? That cry is still being heard today from those who seek to expel religion from discourse and influence. If religion is not, not there to help with shaping character and mediating hard times, who will be? Who will teach honesty, gratitude, forgiveness, and patience? Who will exhibit charity, compassion, and kindness for the forgotten and the downtrodden? Who will embrace those who are different yet deserving as are all of God's children? Who will open their arms to those in need and seek no recompense? Who will reverence peace and obedience to laws greater than the trends of the day? Who will respond to the Savior's plea, Go and do thou likewise? We will. Yes, brothers and sisters, we will. I invite you to champion the cause of religious freedom. Is it, an, it is an expression of the God-given principle of agency. Religious freedom brings balance to competing philosophies, the good of religion, its reach, and the daily acts of love which religion inspires only multiply when we protect the freedom to express and act on core beliefs. I witness that Russell M. Nelson is God's living prophet. I testify that Jesus Christ leads and guides this Church. He atoned for our sins, was crucified on a cross, and was resurrected on the third day. Because of Him, we can live again for all eternity, and those who so desire can be with our Father in heaven. This truth I proclaim to all the world. I am grateful for the freedom to do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I will speak about self-reliance and how it can be taught to children and to youth. Self-reliance may be perceived as being a subject matter for adults. I've come to know that adults can best be on the path towards self-reliance when they have been taught the gospel of Jesus Christ and have practiced its doctrine and principles since childhood and as youth in the home. The best illustration is a great real-life example. Wilfrid Vietbanier, his seven siblings, and his mother joined the church in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, when he was six years old. He was baptized at eight. His father, the main provider in the family, died when he was 11. Though saddened by the family situation, Wilfrid decided to continue in school with his mother's encouragement and with church support. He graduated from secondary school and served a full-time mission in the Ghana Cape Coast Mission, where he learned English. After his mission, he went on to the university and obtained a diploma in accounting and finance. 
Though it was hard to obtain employment in this field, he found work in the tourism and hospitality industry. He started as a waiter in a five-star hotel, but his passion to improve pushed him to, be, to learn more until he became a bilingual receptionist there. When a new hotel opened, he was hired as the night auditor. Later, he enrolled in BYU Pathway Connect and is currently studying a course to obtain a certificate in tourism and hotels. His desire is to one day become the manager of a high-end hotel. Wilfrid can provide for his eternal companion and two children, as well as help his mother and his siblings. He currently serves in the church as a member of the State High Council. Self-reliance is defined as, quote, the ability, commitment, and effort to provide the spiritual and temporal necessities of life for self and family, close quote. Striving to be self-reliant is part of our work along the covenant path that leads us back to Heavenly Father and to His Son, Jesus Christ. It will strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ and joyfully bind us to Him through the covenants and ordinances of salvation and exaltation. Self-reliance is a doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not a program. It is a process that lasts a lifetime not an event. We become self-reliant throughout our lives by growing in spiritual strength, physical and emotional health, pursuing our education and employment, and being temporally prepared. Is this task ever finished during our lives? No. It is a lifelong process of learning, growth, and work. It never ends. It is a continuous daily process. How can we teach the doctrine and principles of self-reliance to our children and youth? One important way is to regularly apply the principles of the Children and Youth Development Program. Parents and children learn the gospel of Jesus Christ, participate in service and activities, and work together in four areas of personal development that are unique for each child it is no longer the same primary program for all. The Children's Guidebook says, quote, when Jesus was your age, he learned and grew. You are learning and growing too. The scriptures say, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This scripture refers to growth and learning in the spiritual aspect, favor with God, the social aspect, favor with man, the physical aspect, stature, and the intellectual aspect, wisdom. These developmental areas apply to all of us, no matter our age. When do we teach them? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, we read, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We teach these things to children by our good example, working and serving with them, studying the scriptures, and following the teachings of Jesus Christ as taught by prophets. I've mentioned that in the Children and Youth Development Program, children choose different goals in each one of the four areas of development. It is important that they create their own goals in each area. Parents and leaders can teach, counsel, and support. For example, our granddaughter Miranda is very motivated to grow spiritually by participating in daily early morning seminary classes. She became interested by hearing positive comments from other seminary students in her ward. Her mother does not have to wake her up for class. On her own, she's up and connected by video conference at the appointed time of 6.20 in the morning because she has developed good habits that help her to do so. My own parents told me recently that Miranda now talks more when she visits them as she has grown in self-confidence. These are lessons for life 
and growth with noticeable outcomes. Parents, grandparents, leaders, and friends assist in the growth and development of the children. Fully engaged ministering brothers and sisters, together with priesthood and organization leaders of the ward, provide support. The family a proclamation to the world says, by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. In these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Extended families should lend support when needed. That last line refers to grandparents, among others. As we serve in West Africa, my wife, Nuria, has done a remarkable job ministering and remaining connected with our family and grandchildren across the ocean. She does this by using technology. She reads books to the younger grandchildren. She teaches the older granddaughters topics like the story of our family, science, history of Puerto Rico, the articles of faith, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Distances nowadays do not limit connecting, belonging, ministering to, and teaching the rising generation of our families. I also join in with Nuria when I can to teach our precious grandchildren to love them, to spoil them, and make them laugh. You should notice the inspired similarities between children and youth development and building self-reliance. The four areas of development in each are very similar. Spiritual strength in self-reliance relates with the spiritual in children and youth. Physical and emotional health in self-reliance connect with the physical and social in children and youth. Education, employment, and temporal preparedness in self-reliance are akin to the intellectual in the children and youth development program. In closing, let us follow our Savior Jesus Christ and his gospel by becoming self-reliant throughout our lives and teaching this to our children and youth. We can do this best by, number one, being good examples of service to others, two, living and teaching the doctrine and principles of self-reliance, three, obeying the commandment to build self-reliance as part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doctrine and Covenants, section 104, verses 15 and 16 says, and it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine, but it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. His gospel blesses families here on earth and throughout the eternities. It guides us, guides us in our lives as we strive to become eternal families. I know this is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided us this morning. The choir will now favor us with If the Savior Stood Beside Me. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing It Is Well With My Soul. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Benjamin De Hoyos of the Seventy.
My dear brothers and sisters, I love you. I cherish this opportunity to speak with you today. I pray daily that you will be protected from the fierce attacks of the adversary and have the strength to push forward through whatever challenges you face. Some trials are deeply private burdens no one else can see. Others are played out on the world stage. The armed conflict in Eastern Europe is one of these. I have been to Ukraine and Russia many times. I love those lands, the people, and their languages. I weep and pray for all who are affected by this conflict. As a church, we're doing all we can to help those who are suffering and struggling to survive. We invite everyone to continue to fast and pray for all the people being hurt by this calamity. Any war is a horrifying va a violation of everything the Lord Jesus Christ stands for and teaches. None of us can control nations or the actions of others, or even members of our own families. But we can control ourselves. My call today, dear brothers and sisters, is to end conflicts that are raging in your heart your home, and your life. Bury any and all inclination to hurt others. What are those inclinations be a, a temper, a sharp tongue, or a, a resentment for someone who has hurt you? The Savior commanded us to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, and to pray for those who despitefully use us. It can be painfully difficult to let go of anger that feels so justified. It can seem impossible to forgive those whose destructive actions have hurt the innocent. And yet the Savior admonished us to forgive all men. We are followers of the Prince of Peace. Now more than ever, we need the peace only He can bring. How can we expect peace to exist in the world when we are not individually seeking peace and harmony? Brothers and sisters, I know what I'm suggesting is not easy. But followers of Jesus Christ should set the example for all the world to follow. I plead with you to do all you can to end personal conflicts that are currently raging in your hearts and in your lives. May I underscore this call to action by discussing a concept I was reminded of recently while watching a basketball game. In that game, the first half was a seesaw battle, back and forth. Then during the last five seconds of the first half, a guard on one team made a beautiful three-point shot. With only one second left, his teammate stole the inbound pass and made another basket at the buzzer. So that team went into the locker room four points ahead with a palpable surge of momentum. They were able to carry that momentum into the second half and win the game. Momentum is a powerful concept. We all have experienced it in one form or another. For example, in a vehicle that picks up speed or with a disagreement that suddenly turns into an argument, so I ask, what can ignite spiritual momentum? We've seen examples of both positive and negative momentum. 
We know followers of Jesus Christ who became converted and grew in their faith. But we also know of once committed believers who fell away. Momentum can swing either way. We have never needed positive spiritual momentum more than we do now. To counteract the speed with which evil and the darker signs of times are intensifying, positive spiritual momentum will keep us moving forward amid the fear and uncertainty created by pandemics, tsunamis, volcanic eruption, and armed hostilities. Spiritual momentum can help us withstand the relentless, wicked attacks of the adversary and thwart his efforts to erode our personal spiritual foundation. Many actions can ignite positive spiritual momentum. Obedience, love, humility, service, and gratitude are but a few. Today, I would like to suggest five specific actions we can take to help us maintain positive spiritual momentum. First, get on the covenant path and stay there. Not long ago, I had a vivid dream in which I met a large group of people. They asked me many questions, most frequent of which was about the covenant path and why is it so important? In my dream, I explained that we enter the covenant path by being baptized and by making our first covenant with God. Each time we partake of the sacrament, we promise again to take the name of the Savior upon us, to remember him and keep his commandments. In return, God assures us that we may always have the Spirit of the Lord to be with us. Later, we make additional covenants in the temple where we receive even greater promises. Ordinances and covenants give us access to godly power. The covenant path is the only path that leads to exaltation and eternal life. Well, in, in my dream, a woman then asked how someone who's broken their covenants can get back on the path. My answer to her question leads to my second suggestion. Discover the joy of daily repentance. How important is repentance? Alma taught that we should preach nothing save it were repentance and faith on the Lord. Repentance is required of every accountable person who desires eternal glory. There are no exceptions. In a revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord chastised early church leaders for not teaching the gospel to their children. Repenting is the key to progress. Pure faith keeps us moving forward on the covenant path. Please do not fear or delay repenting. Satan delights in your misery. Cut it short. Cast his influence out of your life. Start today to experience the joy of putting off the natural man. The Savior loves us always, but especially when we repent. He promised that through that though mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, my kindness shall not depart from me. If you feel you have strayed off the covenant path too far or too long and have no way to return, that simply is not true. Please contact your bishop or branch president. He is the Lord's agent and will help you experience the joy and relief of repenting. Now, a caution. Returning to the covenant path does not mean that life will be easy. This path is rigorous, and at times we will feel like a steep climb. This ascent, however, is designed to test and teach us. 
to refine our natures and help us to become saints. It is the only path that leads to exaltation. One prophet described the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven and dwell with God in a state of never ending happiness. Walking the covenant path coupled with daily repentance fuels positive spiritual momentum. Our third suggestion, learn about God and how he works. One of our greatest challenges today is distinguishing between the truths of God and the counterfeits of Satan. This is why the Lord warned us to pray always that we may conquer Satan and escape the hands of the servants of Satan that do uphold his work. Moses provided an example of how to discern between God and Satan. When Satan came tempting Moses, he detected the deception because he had just had a face-to-face -face interaction with God. Moses quickly realized who Satan was and commanded him to depart. When Satan persisted, Moses knew how to call upon God for more help. Moses received divine strength and rebuked the evil one again, saying, Depart from me, Satan, for this one God only will I worship. We should follow that example. Cast Satan's influence out of your life. Please do not follow him down to his gulf of misery and endless woe. With frightening speed, a testimony that is not nourished daily by the good word of God can crumble. Thus, the antidote to Satan's scheme is clear. We need daily experiences worshiping the Lord and studying his gospel. I plead with you to let God prevail in your life. Give him a fair share of your time. As you do, notice what happens to your positive spiritual momentum. Suggestion number four, seek and expect miracles. Moroni assured us that God has not ceased to be a God of miracles. Every book of scripture demonstrates how willing the Lord is to intervene in the lives of those who believe in him. He parted the Red Sea for Moses, helped Nephi retrieve the brass plates, and restored the church through the prophet Joseph Smith. Each of these miracles took time and may not have been exactly what those individuals originally requested from the Lord. In the same way, the Lord will bless you with miracles if you believe in him. Doubting nothing. Do the spiritual work to seek miracles. Prayerfully ask God to help you exercise that kind of faith. I promise that you can experience for yourself that Jesus Christ giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Few things will accelerate your spiritual momentum more than realizing the Lord is helping you to move a mountain in your life. Suggestion number five, end conflict in your personal life. I repeat my call to end the conflicts in your life. Exercise the humility, courage, and strength required, both to forgive and to seek forgiveness. The Savior has promised that if we forgive men their trespasses, our Heavenly Father will also forgive us. Two weeks from today, we celebrate Easter. 
Between now and then, I invite you to seek an end to a personal conflict that has weighed you down. Could there be a more fitting act of gratitude to Jesus Christ for his atonement? If forgiveness presently seems impossible, plead for power through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ to help you. As you do so, I promise a personal peace and a burst of spiritual momentum. When the Savior atoned for all mankind, he opened a way that those who follow him can have access to his healing, strengthening, and redeeming power. These spiritual privileges are available to all who seek to hear him and follow him. My dear brothers and sisters, with all the pleadings of my heart, I urge you to get on the covenant path and stay there. Experience the joy of repenting daily. Learn about God and how he works. Seek and expect miracles. Strive to end conflict in your life. As you act on these pursuits, I promise you the ability to move forward on the covenant path with increased momentum despite whatever obstacles you face. And I promise you greater strength to resist temptation, more peace of mind, freedom from fear, and greater unity in your families. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. He lives. He loves us and will help us. Of this I testify in the sacred name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the spirit we have felt and the spirit of messages and testimonies that we have received in this Sunday morning session of the General Conference. We thank thee for thine only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for his gospel and restored church in these latter days. We ask thee to bless to President Russell M. Nelson, thy prophet and president of the church, and his dear counselors. We ask thee to bless us to be faithful and resolute to live the gospel and persevere in the covenant path. We are so grateful for the spirit that hath full our hearts and minds. We are so grateful for everything that we were taught today. We ask you to bless us in the rest of the conference. And we ask asking these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.